And when you get to that sort of time depth, the challenges sort of increase, don't they? We had Yucatec, and the first one that branched off was... Uh, Waztec. Waztec, okay. So we have this structure where we have these two branches that branched off first, then the core, which splits into east and west. How am I doing? Yep. Okay. All right. We have a very special episode for you today. We have some... Well, as you can see, we have something new. We have a guest. Uh, today, we are going to be interviewing James Tandy, a Mayanist and a Conlang enthusiast, as you can see from our description. Um, James, thank you so much for uh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, so Mayan is not something, not a family that I know very much about, so I'm very excited to, to learn a ton here today. Uh, we have... Um, Essentially, what we've done is we've taken from our, our Discord community um, a bunch of questions uh, from people who are sort of curious, curious to learn more, and I've added in a few of my own. Um, so I think what maybe we should do is just jump right in, and uh, maybe, James, could you say a little bit of uh, to introduction, let people know uh, who you are, what you're all about? Uh, sure. Uh, well, like Colin said, I'm James Tandy. I, um, I'm at the University of Texas studying Mayan linguistics. And just specifically, I'm interested in um, sort of the the history of morphology and morphosyntax in the family. Um, and I guess I'm working on a dissertation about nominalization and just how that's changed and developed um, over time in the family. Nominalization is a very interesting, very kind of theoretically central topic. Um, what got you into nominalization in Mayan? Um, nominalization, I guess what got me into it is, um, I went in my undergrad, I did a paper on perfect aspect marking in Mayan perfect aspect. We might get into some of this later. We might not. Um, it looks different from the other aspect marking in Mayan languages in that where the others are clearly like they're things that happen on the verb. Perfect marking looks a lot more like it does some nouny things. Um, behaves a lot more like a noun. And so just trying to trace, then in grad school, trying to trace the history of that, um, I kept being just led back into the past of, well, but that perfect marker looks like it came from a gerund, actually. And, and so just led me into this whole world of the history of nominalization. Oh, that's really interesting. The um, Maybe we could do it, lay, lay, a little, uh, lay a little groundwork for people. Um sure. The Mayan family. Uh, what is it? How big of a family is it? When, where is it spoken? By whom? The sort of the basic uh, Mayan for beginners. Sure, sure. Yeah. So um, often one of the questions you'll get as a Mayanist is, well, isn't Mayan a dead language? Or um, so you study hieroglyphs, right? Um, but no, actually, there are still around. Um, 30 to 32 Mayan languages, depending on how you count it. Um, they're all spoken sort of in the area of um, Guatemala, southern Mexico, Belize, um, previously down into El Salvador a little bit. And I don't know, probably around 6 million speakers total, I think is the last figure. So there are actually, you know, a lot of speakers of these languages. If anyone tells you it's an ancient language, uh, now you know, but um, let's see. Did I cover? Was there more to that question? Um, well, the people. I, where does this idea that it's uh, an ancient language? Where does that come from? I, I think probably the the reason is that most of the tr most of the traces of the civilization, like sort of the height of it, was in this classic period, about two hundred A.D. to to 900 AD. That's where a lot of the ruins come from that, that tourists visit and whatever. And, and they're not currently being, those ruins aren't currently being inhabited. So when um, people have heard the name Mayan, they think of that sort of classic period. Yeah, these lost cities being unearthed, stones coming out of the ground with hieroglyphs on them. And the hieroglyphs, could you tell us more, a little bit more about how those work for anyone who hasn't seen uh, the Mayan writing system, the uh, it, it's quite something to behold. Right. Yeah. I guess just to describe it briefly, the, the hieroglyphic system was sort of um, something that the, the Kings and, and their scribes 
uh, would use. It was meant to be ornate. It was meant to sort of show off their skill. And so just visually, it, it's really complex for that reason. Um, but it uses a combination of what are called logograms and syllabograms, where the lo a logogram will represent um, a whole word. Um, it could either be a picture of that thing um, or, or something associated with that thing. So the, the word for snake and the word for four are really similar. And so sometimes you'll see the same glyph used for both. Um, but you'll have glyphs representing words like that. And you'll have a few glyphs, well, several glyphs representing consonant vowel syllables. Um, so combinations of consonant and vowel. And those can be combined with the logogram in different ways to you know, give grammatical information or to spell out words that there isn't a logogram for. Would you compare it to um, things like the cuneiform or the Egyptian hieroglyphic systems? Um, it, it works similar in, in the sense that you have um, you know, signs for words along with phonetic signs. Interesting. It's interesting that the uh, so the earlier system writing systems tend to be of this kind of type, and that the pure phonographic, the pure the systems that purely write sound information, seem to come historically later. Definitely. Yeah, that's quite interesting. So uh, the form of the language written using that system would be what? Uh, like what branch? What branch? Yeah. What which which branch of the family? of the Mayan family does that correspond to? Yeah, so those mostly correspond to the Cholon branch. So the, the Cholon branch was sort of spoken in this this lowland area, um, mostly the southern Mexico area, um, where a lot of the, the ruins are found. Um, but there's some debate whether it's um, like the ancestor of all Cholon languages or just the ancestor of Eastern Cholon languages. There, there's some back and forth in the literature about that. Interesting. So Cholon is one branch of the Mayan family. Yes. What does the overall kind of um, structure of the Mayan family look like, historically speaking? Sure. Um, so, so at the beginning, you have Proto-Mayan. Um, the first branch to split off is Huastecan. Um, Huastec is spoken way farther north in Mexico. The next sort of branch to split off is Yucatecan. Um, if people are traveling and they've come across Mayas in Mexico, it's probably Yucatec Maya. Um, they're sort of spread through the Yucatan Peninsula. The, after Huastec and Yucatec split off, you have sort of this central Mayan or core Mayan group. Um, that then splits in, into Western Mayan and Eastern Mayan, which are sort of the two main I guess, branches that the others fall under. Western Mayan includes Cholon, the language of the glyphs, Tzeltalan, um, which is very close with Cholon, and Anhobalan, which um, is farther up into the highlands, Guatemala, southern Mexico area. On the eastern branch, um, that then gets divided into Mamian and Quichean, which are all in sort of the central Guatemala um, area highland area interesting so we have a we have this sort of th these branches that break off first kind of you know reminiscent from um from like the proto-indo-european uh, you know anatolian to carrion breaking off and then you have the this sort of core uh core group of branches um okay that's interesting so so i think maybe one misconception that people often come to uh mind with is that it's a language and right. I think, you know, just the, the proliferation of different branch names that we've, uh, we've discussed sort of makes it clear that that's not the case. What um, if I know it's hard to um, to quantify these things, but how different are these branches? You know, can we give people a point of reference uh, maybe with respect to languages they may be more familiar with? How how grammatically distinct are they? Yeah, it, it's hard to say, like, uh, um, so, so typically I. You know, com comparing date ranges isn't always helpful for comparing how much they've diverged, but typically it's reconstructed Proto-Mayan to about 2000 BC or thereabouts. Um, 
they're they're close enough that um, like people recognized they were related really early on. Um, so so William Jones had his famous quote noticing that Greek and Latin and Sanskrit were related late 1700s. Um, I believe there were sources as early as 1700 saying, oh yeah, these these Mayan, you know, Maya and Quiche and and these other languages that they knew about, oh, they, they all look like they're related somehow. So you could say that it predates the, um, the hypothesis of Proto-Indo-European. In some ways. <laughs> that's really interesting. And that's not something that I would have, uh, I would have realized. Okay, so, so we've got this, um, the overall structure of the, the family. We know where, when, who, roughly. Um, in the present day, what is the sort of sociolinguistic situation like uh, for Mayan languages spoken now, today? Do they, uh, they have a particular relationship with uh, Spanish that's worth noting? Yeah, well, so definitely Spanish is the dominant language um, in this area. There has been a lot of, um, I guess, not sure how deep into, to go into the history of it, but just, um, you know, people being persecuted for being Mayan and, um, you know, targeted during the Civil War um, in the 1900s. Um, so, you know, they, over time, they've, they've often been told, oh, you just speak a dialect where, where Spanish is a, a language that like sort of dialecto is a little bit more derogatory in Spanish than dialect is in English. Um, they, they've been told they speak a dialecto, but sort of in the last several decades, there's been some activism of um, like trying to, especially in Guatemala, which I'm more familiar with, um, I'm not as familiar with the situation in Mexico, like trying to gain more official recognition. So uh, officially Mayan languages are recognized as national languages in Guatemala. Um, they're not always given the same resources as Spanish is, of course. Um, but typically what you'll find in Mayan communities is um, sort of this shift happening where a lot of the older um, a lot of the older people in the community still speak a Mayan language, sometimes even monolingually when, and you know, the 20, 30, 40 year olds will be pretty balanced bilinguals. And then the children, it, depending on the community, they, they might only passively speak Mayan. Mm. So they are pretty endangered with respect to Spanish. Okay. So. So hopefully that orients us well enough to sort of dive a little bit deeper into what's going on with the what's going on in the Mayan family linguistically. Typologically speaking, what is uh, what's notable about Mayan? What might people you know if they've heard of Mayan? What would be the one thing that pops into their mind, or one or two things? Yeah. Um, so one of the first things is they have a lot of glottalized sounds. Um, they have a contrast between plane stops. Um, so p, t, k, and sometimes u uvular p, and glottalized sounds, uh, well, depending on the language, p, t, k, k, um, I, I said depending on the language because the, the p is sometimes actually a b, a, and, an implosive b. Right, yeah, sometimes the, uh, <laughs> the contrasts don't come in over the, uh, the audio, so those would be, um, were we hearing Ejectives and ejectives and an implosive for the b. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, the the bilabial one is usually implosive, and the others are usually ejectives. Interesting. Um, so yeah, some languages have actually innovated a bilabial ejective to go along with the implosive. Really, interesting. So that phonologically, we have this um, this set of glottalized consonants. Uh, what about morphologically? Morphologically, I guess the, the big thing that stands out if you're learning a Mayan language is they have ergative alignment, which I, I guess we could explain that a little more. Um, it, uh, there, I did a video on it, but for those who haven't seen it, um, maybe could you give it the, the 30 second introduction? Sure. I, I guess every language will have a way to distinguish subjects and objects of transitive verbs. Um, so, so in, in English, we have 
um, he saw her, where, where, or, or I guess I'll use this, the same pronoun. So he saw him. Um, he is a subject. Him is an object. Intransitive verbs in English take um, the same form as the subject of a transitive verb. So, so he walked. In Mayan languages, um, the subject of an intransitive verb is actually marked like the object of a transitive verb. So it would be like if you said him walked. Interesting. Yeah. So this is not that uncommon worldwide, um, right? But it's it's sort of notable for people who haven't come to, who haven't experienced before Mayans, a branch or a, a family in which you find it. Is it um, ubiquitous in the Mayan languages? It's pretty well ubiquitous. A lot, a lot of the languages have what's called split ergativity, um, which is that um, in a certain situation, which it can be con conditioned either by, you know, tense and aspect, um, it, that's usually con the conditioning factor in Mayan, um, they will switch from the ergative pattern to what's called a nominative accusative pattern, like English. So in some tenses, you would get the ergative absolutive alignment, and in some tenses you'd get, or aspects, you would get the nominative accusative alignment. Exactly. So it would be like in English, for past tense, we would have something like him walked, but then present, it would be he walks. Interesting. Yeah, split ergativity. Very fun topic. So, okay, so we have the this glottalized series of consonants. We have uh, split ergativity. Anything else typologically um, worth noting about Mayan? I guess one of the big things that that always stands out when I'm looking at Mayan languages is they have a really, really strong inflection class um, distinction where, especially for transitive verbs, they will have a, a contrast between roots, which are usually consonant, vowel consonant, and derived stems, which they can either come from nouns, from adjectives, from other verbs, um, but um, they're you know, some larger stem than a root. And pretty consistently across Mayan languages, those two will take different morphology, different derivational morphology in particular. Really? Oh, that's interesting. So once you've left the domain of just attaching to a bare root, you're going to enter, a, a, you're going to have a completely different um, morphological marking. Is it completely right. different or is it slightly different? Uh, most of the inflection is the same because the inflection is more like clitics. They're not as tightly bound to the verb, um, but especially the the derivational morphology is a lot different. Oh, interesting. Is there an interesting uh, diachronic story for that? It goes all the way back as far as we can tell. Really? Um, yeah. So it's a steady Every Mayan thing language that's... does it. Wow. Is it reconstructed for Proto-Mayan then? I believe so. Interesting. Okay. So that's our, our canvas to work with today. Um, maybe we should start and talk a little bit about phylogenetics, the relationships sure. of the different Mayan languages to each other. Um, well, or maybe we can even zoom out a little bit further to start with and the relationship of Mayan as a family to other families. First of all, is there anything that's been sort of proposed, accepted, debated? What's the story there? You could almost ask what hasn't been proposed. Um, but so basically, if there's any other major family in the Americas, someone has tried to connect Mayan to it. Um, but it, a lot of the proposals have centered around um, two other families from from farther north in Mexico, the the Mique Sokean languages, which includes languages like Mique and Soke um, from the Valley of Mexico. And then Totonacan, which is farther north, sort of along the coast. They've, they've been hotly debated, but sort of in the last five, ten years, there has sort of been some serious evidence, some just really, really detailed, serious, I guess, serious proposals put forward um, connecting it to Mika Sokayan. Interesting. Noting regular sound changes. Is it based on... Um... So, so, in your estimation, is it uh, kind of a growing consensus, or is it something that's still that the the field's still feeling its way in? Um, somewhere between. Um, so, I guess the the linguists who are more cautious ab about 
positing long distance relationships ha- have always kind of said if anything would pan out it would be Mikhail Sokayan. Um so Lyle Campbell among others um has said things like that. And I guess the the field seems to be favorable to it, but there there's still just a lot of groundwork to flesh out the proposal. I mean, you get to that sort of time depth, the challenges sort of increase, don't they? And it becomes hard to distinguish the signal from the noise. Exactly. Um, what about um, Yudo as Tekken? Have there been any serious proposals made there? Um, I think it would be hard to connect Mayan to Yudo as Tekken. Um, like, Yudo as Tekken is generally believed to be from farther north and to have come southward later on. Um, there has been more recent, say, contact between Mayan and Yudo Aztecan. Interesting. So loan words, for instance. So the the sort of the ancestral homeland of Yudo Aztecan is is not in central Mexico, but but much farther north. Depending on who you ask, but generally the consensus is farther north. Interesting. Okay. Um, so then, zooming into the Mayan family itself. Um, we've talked about the, uh, we've talked about the different branches that have, the, what were they? Let me see if I I can remember. We had, um, Yucatec and the first one that branched off was Uh, Waztec. Waztec. Okay. So, um, so we have this structure where we have these, these two branches that branched off first then the core, which splits into East and West. Um, How am I doing? Yep. Okay. So. What um, what are the 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 ways in which we make these distinctions? How how can we how easy is it to sort of identify shared innovations in these in these branches? Um, well, the fun part is shared innovations are are really hard to track down. But most of the tree has actually been um, constructed based on lexicon. Um, so um, the the word for for man and for field and and a lot of the basic vocabulary is, is really really consistent within each branch, um, and, and so people have constructed the tree on that basis. Um, but as far as say what you'd normally look for, shared innovations in phonology, shared innovations in morphology, those are actually not as clear. Really, what makes them not as clear? I guess there's there's just been ton of contact between Mayan languages. Um, and we were talking about this a little bit, getting ready for the interview, but just some branches actually just don't have any innovations that aren't contact related. Really? How do you, yeah. how do you even go about parsing out whether something is contact related or not in this, in this situation? Um, I guess one way to go about it is, um, just if the branches have, have been pretty well delimited on other grounds. So, so the, the lexicon is a pretty strong signal. Like if you were to, um, you know, people doing the computational models have, you know, plugged in the lexical data and the, the, the tree comes out pretty well based on the lexicon. Um, if you were to plug in the phonological data, it's even, it, it's really fuzzy, which sort of indicates that there's been a lot of crossing between the branches. But aren't lexical things rather easy to borrow? You'd think so. Um, but I, I'm not sure why there was so much less. I mean, there has been lexical borrowing, but I guess not enough to throw off the tree structure. Interesting. But but the other way that you would go about telling is just if the if the sounds and and other innovations cluster in a certain area. So, for example... Um, the, the Mamian languages, which are from the eastern branch, and the Anhobalan languages, which are from the western branch, they share things like they innovated retroflex consonants. Um, they innovated noun classifiers. Um, and they, they innovated VSO word order, where VOS is the default in Mayan languages. And just th- these things sort of clustering together in this geographic area um, where otherwise we would have reason to keep them distinct, the, the two branches. Okay. Sort of points to contact. Two things 
popped up for me there. I'm trying to see if I can keep both of them in mind because I think both are kind of interesting to, directions to go down. Yeah. One is VOS. Yes. That's interesting. So it, VOS is what's reconstructed for Protomaya or is it just sort of the the um, the overall most common order? Uh, both. And one of the least common orders typologically. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, I forget the exact numbers, but it's the non... The, the orders in which object precedes subject are definitely less than 10% of all languages. So that's that's something. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so so the... I didn't know that about mine. That's really cool. Um, and then the second question is, is there a... From what we know about the history, what what's the what are the circumstances which caused these contact situations to to come about? Um, it's hard to say. So so for Mamian and Khan Hobalan, I'm not sure whether it was trade or 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 what. Um, sort of a there's a a bigger zone of contact in sort of the the lowlands, the the northern Guatemala, southern Mexico a zone of contact between Yucatecan, Cholan, Saltalan, with spillage and to others. And that probably was a lot due to this classic Maya period where, where all the hieroglyphs were being written, these cities were being built, sort of the Cholans had a a bit of social dominance over the area. And so do so, we see the uh, contact go in that direction from Cholan to others, or is it even hard to answer that question? It's sometimes hard to answer that question. Uh, so for for a given change, say that the innovation of the the bilabial ejective that I was talking about earlier, that's one of those features that's spread through the lowlands. And people have argued did this start in Cholan and then spread to the others that they sort of had hegemony over, or was it that it started in Yucatec and then spread to Cholan and, and out? Interesting. Yeah, I suppose when you only see the outcome, it's very hard to understand the direction. Um, exactly. And other than the hieroglyphs, we don't have records going back that far. What, um, so how, uh, how to put this, how, how helpful is the writing system for um, reconstruction of, the, of that stage of the Cholan family? Um, it's helpful. Um, the The issue is, uh, I guess, a lot of the understanding of the hieroglyphs had to be based on, like, reconstruction. Um, so it, it's not completely circular. Like, once you see, um, say, this word associated with a picture in the glyphs, you, you can figure those things out. Um, but it's sort of a, a, a self, not circular logic, but it's like both both fields reinforce each other it, it kind of reminds me of the situation where um you use loan words in linguistic reconstruction but those loan words so if a if language a borrowed a word from language b at a particular stage it tells you something about how they and and you see they adapted it one way that tells you something about how language a worked but it also depends on your understanding of how that language b worked and so you right. have but eventually if you you know you cross this with other kinds of data you look at the, um, you know, the, the pathways have changed. Do they match what we tend to know happens? It's not, yeah, I agree. It's not totally circular. Um, or maybe even it's not very circular. There's an aspect though that, where you have to do, you have to be a bit careful. Exactly. Well, and sometimes people have argued that over the, the corpus we have of the glyphs, um, so the glyphs had a, a calendar associated with them, which means you can date the inscriptions in time and people have argued that you can see changes spreading from west to east or east to west um i'm not as familiar with that literature but people have sort of argued that across the corpus you can see some of these changes spreading so if we have all of this kind of contact based spreading does that also extend outside of the buy-in family definitely there there are some features that sort of extend all up through Mesoamerica. I guess Mesoamerica broadly defined as sort of Mexico down through Central America and, and you know, El Salvador and farther south. 
like what would the, what what are those features so so one is a, a base 20 counting system um, you could argue that that's maybe a you could argue that a counting system is more of a technology than a linguistic feature per se but a, a base 20 counting system is in most of the languages of mesoamerica um certain like like the way you the, the equivalent to prepositions the way you form spatial relations is it uses particular body part metaphors so so its head the it, it its head the stick on on top of the stick um it, its foot the tree below the tree oh interesting and what would be the other families that participate in this so what who are the the neighbors of the the mayan family um so the neighbors would be so Mike Sokean, Yuruas Tekken, and Totonakan to the north, um, as well as several language isolates, um, Otomangian languages, if people have heard of Zapotec, um, that would be farther north. Um, to the south, there are languages like Shinka, uh, Lenka, th those are pretty heavily endangered. Um, I'm not as familiar with the families to the south, um, but there are several other language families in the area. Interesting. So base 20 counting, um, these body part, um, I don't know, what, what, what would we call them? Directional uh, locative constructions? Uh, uh, is there, like a, is there a term of art for this? Um, in Mayan, they're typically called relational nouns. Okay, relational nouns. Um, anything else in this? Uh, so this is, a, we're talking about like a linguistic area here. Mesoamerican right. linguistic area. What are the other characteristics? There are others. Um, I think verb first word order is one of them. Um, it's not present in every language, but it's present in a lot of them. Interesting. So, so we have this is one of the sort of the classic linguistic areas of the world, isn't it? Right. And it's very interesting that the that within Mayan, the relationships are so obscured by contact effects. I mean, maybe it's not surprising that, that, that those effects would extend across families as well. That mm -hmm. it's just, there seems to be something going on in this part of the world where, where innovations or, or features hop from one language to another or even across families. Right. That's interesting. And so this makes it the job of a historical linguist a bit tough. Definitely. Um, does this also, so in phonology, we have things... I have some questions here for, for phonology. Maybe we could jump over to that. Um, sure. Tone in the Mayan languages. First of all, is it there? Yes. So I guess there, there are four different languages that seemingly independently innovated tone. Yucatec is one. Um, Uspantec in the Quechean branch. Some dialects of some varieties of Tzotzil in the Tzeltalan branch and um, Mocho, which is sort of at the it's a, it's a Conjobalan language, sort of at the border of Mexico and Guatemala. Interesting. So, what do these tone systems look like? Um, they're mostly um, a high, low, neutral kind of system. Um, this isn't as much my wheelhouse as other things, but typically it's a high, either high and neutral or high, low and neutral. Do we get a lot of the, you know, sometimes in the tone literature, we hear the distinction between uh, this sort of Southeast East Asian type tone system with contours, lots of um, tone sundi and things like that. And the Sub-Saharan African style tone system where you have um, a lot of level tones, a lot of things like downstep and, uh, does do the Mayan tone systems, from what you know, um, behave more like one or the other? Um, I guess I'm not as directly familiar with it to to answer that, but I, I guess to to illustrate from Yucatec, sh short vowels in Yucatec usually just have no tone. Um, long vowels can have either a, a a high tone, a low tone, or they'll have like a high and then like high low with a, a glottal stop in the middle of the long vowel. Interesting. Interesting. So, so the that glottal stop sort of occurs along with this tone contour. Something like that. 
I, oh. I think it was the glottal stop was there before. I, I could be wrong on that. Interesting. So diachronically, I mean, I, I know you're you're more of a morphosyntax um, uh, specialist, but you know, I think we have some some real curiosity in the chat here about tone. Um, what is the? Do you know anything about the the tonogenesis story in these languages? Uh, typically, they come from laryngeal consonants, so, so um, glottal stop and glottal fricative after a vowel. So, so can't think of an example right off. Uh, I guess the the word for to write, tib. So t t z glottal. Uh, well, I'm, I'm saying in the new orthography, but. Um, T Z glottal I H B. Um, that H would get deleted and lead to a high tone in some languages and a low tone in other languages. Okay. So not the not the usual um, Southeast Asian style tonogenesis story. Um, that's interesting. The given that um, that mine has this series, this glottalized series, does that interact with tone at all? Um, I'm not sure. That's it. That's, um, yeah, that, that'd be, I'd be interested to learn that. Um, okay. Phonation contrast. So this glottal series, do we know anything about its, um, its diachronic story? Where does it come from? How does it innovate in different branches? Does it get lost? I, I know you mentioned um, that there's a, a a re or an innovation of a, an ejective, bilabial ejective in some branches? Right. Yeah, so so as to where it came from, um, I, I mentioned that sort of the strongest historical proposal is to connect it to Mikhe Sokayan. So, so all Mayan languages have this contrast between plain and glottalized. So we know that we can reconstruct it to Proto-Mayan. Um, Mikhe Sokayan has just a smaller consonant inventory overall. So in the in the proposed proto proto language, even the proto proto language has glottal, the glottal contrast. So just we don't know where it came from before that. Interesting. So this is not something that we that there's been any explanation tried for because as far back as you go, it seems to be needed. Exactly. Even even in these sort of more super family style proposals, they're still there. Exactly. Oh, that's interesting. So that contrast is very stable then diachronically. It is. That's interesting. But the exact way in which it caches out is different from from branch to branch. Is that correct? Um, I mean, I mean, it's the the main point of variation is the bilabial um, glottalized sound. Um, so so proto Mayan had a contrast between p and glottal and implosive b. And one of these lowland sound changes that that spread through Cholan, Yucatec, and and others um, was that sort of along with the implosive b, they innovated ejective p to go along with it. Um, so probably the motivation was um, symmetry in the system, where the the alveolar and the the velar and the um, I guess uvular for the languages that have still had uvulars, um, they all had an, an ejective version. And so they're like, well, why doesn't the bilabial one also have an ejective? And so they innovated it. So this is this, um, for those who watched the stream on Tuesday, this is this idea of, of constant inventory gra uh, gaps being filled by, by sound change. There's, a, th there's an idea that's been out there for a long time that um, constant inventory gaps are kind of disfavored. There's some sort of pressure in languages to, to make good use of their, the phonological features that they use and not to allow uh, any combination that makes articulatory sense to go uh, unexpressed. And so this would be an example of, of that kind of a change if you wanted to analyze it that way. Mm -hmm. So you, it's as if you have access to the concept of ejectiveness why not? You know, why don't we have that in the labials? You know, we have it everywhere else. That's interesting. So that and that's an innovation that um, that creates a three-way contrast in the labial stops, and that occurs in the lowlands area. Is that right? Exactly. Interesting. So, in terms of the overall picture of the historical phonology of the Mayan languages, are there any that are particularly conservative? 
any that are particularly innovative? I know you said that there are some branches that are hard to pick out based on shared innovation, but are there are there any that are? Um, yeah, it, it's hard to pick out that like they all have they all have some kind of innovation, even if the those innovations are from contact. Um, but I don't know. You can argue one of the most conservative is Mocho. Like it keeps the the velar and uvular contrast. It it. And I remember the argumentation for this, not necessarily. <laughs> but another is Ishiel. Like Protomyon had this contrast between um, a, a plain T, a you know an alveopalatal ch, and this sort of palatalized alveolar t. And Ishiel is act like. The Chahul variety of Ishiel has argued to be like one of the only varieties of Mayan that actually keeps this three-way contrast. That seems like a super diachronically unstable contrast to keep. It is. Basically, yeah. every other language loses it. So if, okay, I'll put you at the spot here and ask if, to use the Romance language as a metaphor, which Mayan variety is the French, which is the one that's diverged the most? Oh, that's tough. Um... Which Mayan variety is the French? That's hard to say, honestly. <laughs> well, maybe the question itself doesn't doesn't work as well in Mayan, given the special kind of contact situation that that's going on there. Yeah. Well, and honestly, so I guess I'll to to speak within the Quechean branch, which I'm most familiar with. Um, like one thing I've noticed is that say, I think the Quechean branch is about as divergent as romance languages, for example, but most of the variation is actually morphosyntactic. If you listen to um, any of the, if you know one of the Quechean languages and, and you listen to another one, they, they sound really, really, really similar. Um, it's not like, say, we're, you know, you listen to, to French or Spanish or Romanian and they have these really, three really distinct sounds. Um, I don't notice as much of a like stark contrast in sound as I do in, in, in grammar. Interesting. So what, maybe we can turn our attention to, to the grammar then. Um, what kind of differences are there? So, I mean, we talked about split ergativity being one. Um, again, something that's argued to be one of these lowland changes where just you'll have an ergative pattern in some situations and an accusative pattern in other situations. One is that, I guess, the aspect system is very different. Sometimes where, like, say, Pokomchi, the language I'm, like, most familiar with is, it, it uses this progressive construction that's based on a nominalization, um, where that would be an innovation with that Kiche, another Kiche in language doesn't have. I guess some languages have made some pretty radical reanalysis of person marking. So Proto Mayan had a a, a six way um, person marker contrast. So first, second, third, singular, and plural. Um, but some languages actually merged the the first and second, or they, they merged the singular and plural forms. And instead of having a separate marker, they would just use the singular pronoun with a, a plural marker on it. Interesting. Kind of, to make an analogy here, kind of like the English form use. Right? We oh, have, yeah. We have the, the merger of the singular and plural second person pronoun in the history of English, going going in favor of the plural, but um, but relatively similar. And then we have a re-innovation of a plural by using the normal plural marker. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interesting. So if we had... Uh, I's, I's use and he's, she's, that would be, uh, that'd be the English version of that. Oh, that's really cool. I'm seeing some, some questions come in from the chat here. Maybe I can, uh, toss some of them to you. Sure. Do we have any, uh, any cases in which Mayan was affected by other languages in the area? Can we, can we ever point the direction of that change from some of Mayan's neighbors to, to Mayan? Um, so sometimes it's easy, like when you have loan words. So 
um, well, obviously from Spanish into Mayan, it, it's easy to tell. You you can see when something's a Spanish word and because you're familiar with it from Spanish. Um, but say from you to Aztec, and I mentioned there had been some more recent contact, the word for deer in a lot of the Highland languages is um, masat, which in, in Nahuatl, the word would be something like masat, mm. and, and that goes farther back in Yudo Aztec. And, oh, cool. Um, so so loan words are sometimes easier. Um, the the noun classifiers that I mentioned in Kanhobalan, um, people have argued that those were potentially influenced from Otomangian languages farther north. Maybe we could uh, spend a few minutes on these these noun classifiers. How do they work? Are they could you compare them to like the kind that you see in Bantu, or is it more like the kind you see in Sinitic? Um, I guess I can't speak to either of those necessarily, but I guess just to describe. Yeah, that's probably the, even the best way. Um, so some languages will have say numeral classifiers where the number will be followed by a morpheme that, that indicates the class of the noun that follows. So, um, hun is one in in a lot of languages and say we knock is the word for man it, it would be like if if it if something like hun el we knock i probably just mixed several languages there but um one person man okay that that kind of reminds you the way that it works in 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 Sinitic. you have okay. this like these these classifiers or measure words or whatever you want to call them that that differ um that differ from you know, depending on what noun you're talking about they're sort of lexically specified classifiers that go with um with different nouns and then there's a sort of a fallback elsewhere case right and then sort of the other type which is especially what shows up in in mame and kanhobalan languages is where it's actually more like a pronoun um so we knock is the word for man and a lot of the time, just a noun referring to a person will be, it, it'll have the just the word knock before it. Um, knock, Jose, like person, Jose, did this or that. Kind of reminds me of Tokipona a little bit. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have this um, Jan person. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Jan prefix. Yeah. That's cool. And then it, it might be te for something that's made of wood just the, the word for tree or wood. It almost reminds me of um, the, this is in writing systems, but those determinatives in um, say um, Egyptian, in the Egyptian hieroglyph system. Oh yeah. Yeah. Although I don't think they're pronounced. <laughs> right. That's cool. Uh, I see another question here. Um, oh, this one is, this is an interesting question. We got a, a, a question about a specific reference. Um, this is from uh, Valkanaman. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, and go with the IPA values of things. I once found an online copy of Joshua Inman Smith, Manual of Spoken Tzeltzal. I lost it, unfortunately. Is it available anywhere? Do you know? I'm not familiar with that one specifically. <laughs> um, and another question about a similar uh, work for uh, Tzotzil. Um... The one I'm most familiar with there is John Haviland's grammar. Um, I think there's a Spanish and English version. I don't know if it's publicly available anywhere. Um, I'm not sure. But booksellers near you, perhaps. <laughs> um, if someone wanted to sort of get a, get a grasp of what's going on in Mayan, what what would be the one reference that you would recommend them? Oh, that that's tough. Um, like in a particular Mayan language, in a particular Mayan language, or Mayan languages in general. Mayan languages in general, maybe the, especially the historical angle. Um, I guess I would really point them to, um, you know, if they could get access to it, Campbell Lyle Campbell's chapter in a book called The Mayan Languages. Actually, the whole the whole book's really good, but Lyle Campbell's chapter in the Mayan languages is sort of a, a good overview reference. 
Very cool. I know we have a lot of um, people in, here interested in constructed languages. And I, yeah. I see from your, uh, your name tag there that you are as well. Um, are there any uh, features in Mayan languages that you think are sort of underrepresented or unknown in the conlang community that you think you wish would be better known or you'd like to introduce? I, I guess the, the sort of rigid inflection class distinctions that we talked about, I think are kind of cool. The, the fact that Mayan has this distinction between root and derived words. Um, I don't know that I've seen anyone specifically do that in a conlang, um, but just in general, inflection class distinctions are, are fun in conlangs. Yeah, I think um, speaking from personal experience, I think many people get scared off of inflection classes from European languages. There's right. this sort of rebound where the first conlang you make is, you know, whatever two languages you've encountered first. If you, well, it depends on when you, when you do it. When I started conlang, I was like 12. And so I'd encountered French and Latin and I made a nice, a very nice French Latin mix. Um, and then I think there's that phase where you try and move away from that. But, uh, but it is not exclusively a standard average European thing. Right. I guess the other thing would be language contact. Um, like usually we tend to focus on loan words. I mean, not just conlang and linguistics in general, we tend to focus on loan words. Um, just, I don't know. It'd be really fun to see um, just sort of pervasive language contact and, and what it can do in conlangs. Uh, I guess I, I'm trying to go that direction with my own conlangs, but it's slow would going. You, would you like to tell any, us anything about your projects, your conlang projects? Um, I, I guess, I, I guess for mine, I pretty much just, I have one conlang um, from a few years ago that I've been trying to revise and, and revamp. Um, the the sort of conceit of it originally was that it had a syllabic lateral fricative. So the name of the language was Gzma. Oh, very nice. <laughs> and um, th there were some weird things about it, so I rebooted it and, and you know, started over with, okay, here's a proto-language that could lead to that, but actually be realistic. <laughs> Um, and then I sort of, as I went, came up with two other, what I was considering proto languages to, to populate the continent and play with other features that didn't fit with the first one. Yeah. It's very hard to stop at just one. Right. <laughs> My eternal struggle, start a new project or continue an old project. Start a new project. Always. Those who watch the channel know this. <laughs> I guess, how many different families are you up? I, I'm a little bit behind on the videos. How many different families are you up to? I think we've got, so we've got Kal, we've got Sakrat, we've got um, the Birai family, which has not been made into a video yet. Uh, yeah. We've got the family that Quat is in, the the collaboration with Quain. Um, and there's also a, a message, James, for you in the chat from Quain um, saying that uh, that the two of you may have taken Campbell's class together. So hello. Campbell's class? Yeah, I don't know. That's the message in the chat. I don't know. I haven't had a class with Campbell. So. Um, oh. And uh, yeah, so there's four. Then there's another. Yeah, I think we're up to, at five now. It's going. We're not going to stop at five. We're going to have dozens and dozens. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, but anyway more more since we got you here we uh we should ask more about mayan um a galactic sand asks uh do any mayan branches uh have any mayan branches adapted any euroversals from contact things like articles use of a, a van in comparative constructions a distinct reflexive form well i guess some people have argued that mayan languages didn't have definite articles prior to Spanish contact, like they had demonstratives, the this or that kind of words. Um, but some, some people would argue that definite articles are um, like the demonstrative became used as a definite article sort of by virtue of Spanish influence. Um, just because, see, even within Quechean languages, the, the exact word that will be used for the definite article is is different, comes from a different source. Interesting, but it's 
it's invariably used as a definite article? I don't know if I can say invariably, but <laughs> it's always dangerous to say invariably. Um, a lot of languages have it. Hmm. Um, one thing I might be interested in, though, is there's been some um, influence of Mayan on Guatemalan Spanish. Really? Or at least it's at least a contact influenced retention. Um, Mayan, in Mayan languages, if you if you want to say I have one book, um, it's always something like there is one my book because possession is a prefix on the noun um so it would be something like oh hun nu wu there is one my book in in guatemalan spanish you'll you'll have an expression that's i uno mi libro there is one my book oh that's Um, really cool which which is very much not it, it is not standard spanish um it's not necessarily a straight borrowing from Mayan because you can, I mean, some of the colonial records of European Spanish, they'll, they'll have that construction attested, but it's sort of like as everywhere else in the Spanish speaking word world lost this construction, it stayed in Guatemalan Spanish and became pretty common in Guatemalan Spanish by uh, contact with Mayan, it seems. Oh, cool. I, it reminds me kind of of, I think in, in, some varieties of Peruvian Spanish, there's a, a, a possessive form influenced by Quechua, something like de Maria su casa. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know. I just, this is something that I, I heard actually when I was there. Um, really cool. I love finding those things. Let's see. I think I see some more questions coming in. If taken to the extreme, so Galactic Sands, right? Uh, if take, this isn't really a question, but this is a fun question. Uh, observation if taken to the extreme this would eliminate the need for a verb to have um so maybe i can make into a question is there a a distinct verb to have typically not at least it's not the same kind of default verb that it is in european languages Uh, like there there are words meaning like to possess to get to gain but no you you would use this existential construction for for have in most Mayan languages and then uh, Galactic Sand also says, sounds kind of Celtic. Celtic, really? Yeah. Um, uh, things like, at me is, at me is a book. You get those. Oh, I of, see. Or rather, is a book at me because it's BSO. So, you know, there's another point of, uh, point of agreement. Huh. Celtic my. Um, is there anything that else that you would like to say, um, uh, about mine, about uh, your own work. Um... Oh, closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. Uh, hard to say. Um, I guess just, I guess one one other thing that I forgot to mention earlier. Um, I guess just, well, two other things. It, in historical linguistics, we talked about this a little bit before. There's sort of this tension between um, when you're doing historical linguistics, when you're comparing across languages, are, are you just are you just doing math on it? Are you like you're setting up the sound correspondences? You're doing a formula to figure out what's the most likely reconstruction, but you're not trying to claim that anyone actually spoke this way in the past. Um, I very much take more the kind of realist um, idea of it that you no, know, whatever this language was, you know, we can exercise some humility in in how we know what we know, but, you know, these were real people. These are real people speaking the language today. These are real people speaking the language in the past. And just thinking of it that way makes it a lot easier to think through. Like, I don't know. I think it makes it more fun and also just forces you to consider, well, this feature that I'm looking at isn't just, I'm not just looking at nominalization. I'm looking at, well, how would they actually say this in day-to-day life? And I don't know, I, I find that to be the fun part of historical linguistics and conlanging, just making something that a person could use. I, I, this, this debate in historical linguistics about the sort of the realist versus the, I don't know, formulist approach, I've seen it. I think of it as the algebraic approach. I don't know, I like that, that way of putting it. Um, at some point, this, so we know that it had to have been spoken, right? There's a, there, there are some... There are some thorny bits like um, 
given the, re the, the comparative method, we can only sort of reconstruct the last common ancestor. And mm -hmm. the last common ancestor of various parts of the language may be, you know, different actual languages. So the last common right. ancestor of the nominal system might be different from the last common ancestor of the vowel system. And so that, that becomes an issue. But at the same time, you're right that this was presumably people actually spoke, spoke this language that we're reconstructing at some point. Well, we have to have that, that humility, but, but at the same time, we have to figure out a way of squaring that circle. Exactly. Well, and then the other thing I was going to say just on the topic of, um, you know, speakers of the language is a, a I don't know if it was a statistic or, or just a, a factoid I heard um, recently in our department, just um, in Guatemala, there are actually more linguists who are native speakers of indigenous languages than linguists who are not. That's really um, cool just because of all the, the efforts that have been done uh, and, you know, people, you know, taking ownership of their language, of their own languages, studying their own languages. So, you know, independent of us as Northerners it, in this, um, I guess, academic tradition, um, you know, they've interacted with this tradition. Many of them have come, say, to UT to get um, PhDs in linguistics, but native speakers of these languages actively working on their own languages, which is just really, really cool. That is amazing. I think that's it for the questions. Um, James, thank you so much. This has been amazing to learn about Maya and to have you on the, on the stream. Really, really a pleasure. This has been great. Thank you so much. And um, everyone who's been watching, thank you so much for joining and sending in all of your questions. And uh, hopefully, you know, maybe we can get James back on here another time and we can conline together or something. Oh, that'd be fun. All right. Well, uh, uh, thanks to everyone, especially anyone new who came to, to hear about Mayan. Uh, we're so glad you could join us, and we will see you all next time.